So back to NGO 2.0, because we wanted to introduce 2.0 thinking and practice to NGOs, therefore we started off with a social media literacy training. Um, we teach grassroots NGOs in Western and Central provinces of China to learn how to use social media to engage in participatory thinking, launch interactive advocacy campaigns, increase the uh, transparency of NGO operation, design online crowdfunding projects, and learn human-centered design to create solutions to the problems that NGOs are tackling. Uh, to date, we have trained approximately 2,200 NGOs. And this is a part of uh, our curriculum. We also created other programs. For example, we uh, developed a Web 2.0 uh, toolbox for NGOs. And we also built a crowdsourced philanthropy map uh, over which more than 27,000 NGOs have registered their project data and organization data. We also run civic hackathons in collaboration with uh, transnational IT companies, domestic Chinese uh, IT companies, uh, software developer and maker communities, and universities, uh, especially departments of computer science and design uh, in universities. Uh, we have worked with uh, Tsinghua University and the University of Science and Technology of China and the Sun Yat-sen University, et cetera. Uh, as NGO 2.0 evolved, uh, we have grown into uh, an organization with uh, expertise in designing social media for social good and tech for good projects. In short, uh, we practice ICT-powered activism. And in the process, we have grown into a nationwide uh, for lack of a better word, super NGO, working with uh, grassroots NGOs in 34 provinces and uh, municipalities. So all those activities form part of my regular practice as a non-confrontational activist. So now let's uh, take a look at the, the concept of non-confrontationalism. Uh, non-confrontational activism is a thematic thread running through my new book, The Other Digital China. Now, uh, during my 10 year long experience of running NGO 2.0, I encountered uh, a variety of puzzled uh, re responses from my colleagues and friends in the US. They ask, how could a foreign NGO specializing in ICT activism survive at all in such an adverse environment like China? Uh, this question, however, is a false question because, uh, first of all, NGO 2.0 is not an international NGO. From day one, I made sure that we uh, set it up as a local Chinese NGO operated by a largely indigenous Chinese team. We now have uh, seven full-time employees uh, in China. So the challenges at the core of our operation are not much different from those faced by the other grassroots NGOs in China. So we should, so the question we should ask instead is, how have the Chinese NGOs fared uh, through the successive reigns of an authoritarian regime? Well, to fare well in China requires a different mindset and a different strategy, which is learning the art of restraint and following the centuries old cultural logic of finding the middle ground whereby missions, however difficult, will get accomplished. Uh, this, for the Chinese activists, uh, this means producing social good without throwing a street revolution or confronting the state openly and aggressively. Uh, during the past 10 years, uh, I was exposed bit by bit to a gradually unfolding, captivating picture of social media activism in China in which multiple players from diverse sectors are leveraging the network effect of 2.0 to create incremental change in China. And this book is devoted to the ICT practices emerging from China's social sector called at a specific uh, particular historical moment, uh, thanks partly to the arrival of 2.0 technology and cyber utopianism and partly to the Communist Party's alleged commitment to policies aimed at energizing the weak social sector. 
Now, with this book, I was trying to uh, answer, to ask the question, what is the ecosystem of social media uh, activism looking like in China today? Uh, in the old media environment, the major civic actors were NGOs. But since 2009, after uh, social media had gone mainstream in China, Mike, uh, this old ecosystem has changed because microblogging brought in four new groups of social actors. They are the free agents, corporate sector, software developer communities and maker labs, and the university sector. And NGO 2.0 uh, designed projects that involve participants from all those sectors. Uh, I should also note that the great majority of social actors we collaborate with are Chinese millennials and members of the Generation Z. All those social uh, actors share a commitment to making incremental change rather than throwing a street revolution. Um, and uh, together, uh, those actors from diverse sectors are building an invisible coalition to bring incremental change to Chinese society in spite of censorship. Uh, if you want me to choose a single sentence to describe this book, it would be, this is a book about uh, the gray zones in China. Uh, in the gray zones, Chinese activists practice non-contentious social actions. So let's take a deeper dive into this uh, keyword non-confrontational activism and, uh, and, and um, ask what kind of politics it implies and how does the concept and practice of non-confrontationalism challenge the mainstream Western liberal thinking about activism. Chinese social actors I named above uh, don't fit squarely into the profile of activists prescribed in the Western liberal tradition because Chinese change makers are walking around obstacles rather than breaking through them. Um, and they navigate uh, tactfully between what is lawful and what is illegitimate. Uh, we're all familiar with the Western paradigm that tend to equate action with resistance and social change with uh, street revolutions. And I think it is time that non-confrontational activism is conceptualized fully documented with case studies so that we can put on the front burner a very important question, which is uh, the agency of activists operating in authoritarian countries. Now, generally speaking, uh, activists practicing non-confrontationalism are anonymous because their actions purposefully attract no attention. They stay on the margins of history and they remain peripheral to academic discussions about uh, social actions, even though it prevails in all autocratic societies where uh, activists resort to other means of serving social good than openly rebelling and openly critiquing. Uh, in my book, I incorporated a chapter on the critical literature revolving around the concept and practice of non-confrontationalism. Here, I want to single out one such book, James C. Scott's uh, Weapons of the Weak, Everyday Forms of Peasant Resistance. James Scott introduced the concept of invisible agents and their quiet and piecemeal tactics. He also gave credit to what he called the practice of calculated conformity. Uh, he, uh, the, well, James Scott's peasants typically avoid a direct and dramatic confrontation with the authorities. But instead of uh, condemning the peasant's silence, as complicitous or devoid of politics. Uh, Scott uh, locates the sites of peasant action in uh, micro and conspicuous everyday forms of foot dragging, false compliance, faint ignorance, and so on. And this book uh, represents a significant milestone in valorizing the powerless as political agents. Now, when we turn to a country like China, or other illiberal societies where open resistance is an exception rather than the norm, uh, we as researchers are called upon to go beyond the dichotomous mode of thinking to solve a puzzle. The puzzle is why are they exploited in those countries to accept their situation as a normal or even as a justifiable part of social order? 
Are Chinese people fatalistic, complicitous, or paralyzed by fear and cowardice? So this question has been sitting on a lot of people's mind. Uh, surely if the Chinese government could hire as many as 2 million uh, people to insert uh, deceptive writings into social media posts, shouldn't we have good reasons to believe that Chinese censorship has penetrated every corner of that society and that the censors have manipulated the public opinions effortlessly? Well, that is the conventional reading of the muted consensus of Chinese people over maintaining the status quo. And that formulation relegates the entire population of China into the category of the brainwashed. In reality, though, we know that Chinese people have more choices than being brainwashed and becoming martyrs. So what is missing uh, in the scholarly research on China is the massive middle ground in which conformity is often a self-conscious strategy and that it might be possible to think of a continuum of situations ranging from the free dialogue, what Habermas called ideal speech situation or the public sphere, all the way to the concentration camp. So what is understudied in the China field is that continuum of situations or the middle ground or the gray zones in which the Chinese activists navigate day in and day out quite successfully. Uh, as we all knew that the favorite topic, the hardest topic for digital China scholars in the West is Chinese censorship. Uh, with this book, I'm taking a different path. Uh, if we want to understand the real everyday China, it is imperative we go beyond the simple dichotomy of white and black and turn our gaze toward the gray. So all this may sound a bit abstract. What did I mean when I say Chinese activists operate in the gray zones? So let's take NGOs, for example, and illustrate how NGOs in China function in a tightly controlled social space. Or we could ask a slightly different question. What is the relationship between Chinese NGOs and Chinese state? Uh, the shorthand answer to that question is NGOs in China are compelled, are obliged to learn how to navigate within the state apparatus. Now, if you want me to choose uh, three adjectives to describe Chinese NGOs, <clears throat> they would be semi-official, semi-popular, semi-autonomous. Semi-official refer to the NGOs navigating within the state structure. Semi-popular refers to the self-identification of grassroots NGOs. Semi-autonomy is a concept I will explain later. Uh, there is a Chinese saying, Deng Xia Hei. Uh, I, you, you're going to learn quite a few Chinese sayings tonight. Uh, the most invisible place is the spot right underneath the light. This, this spot, this spot, uh, which means no place is safer than the place of danger. In other words, under the surveillance of the party state, it is easier to carve out breathing spaces within the state structure, within the plant space, than create them outside it. Um, so here, hence the Chinese paradox. The closer the relationship of an NGO is to the Chinese state, the more autonomous, uh, the more autonomous uh, it would become. Now, this may still sound abstract, so let me share with you an anecdote. Um, in the late 1990s, I started a collaborative research project with a professor at uh, Peking University uh, on popular media and popular culture in China. Uh, we wanted to hold an international conference in Beijing, but finding a safe conference venue was very difficult because the word media in the conference title is politically sensitive in China. We eventually overcame the problem by holding our conference at a state-owned and state-run hotel. We were able to do this because one of our participants uh, had a personal relationship with the hotel manager. So there was no surveillance, no questions asked, and uh, the conference went on very smoothly. So this is a very good example that illustrates what I meant by the safest place is the place of danger. The most invisible place is the spot right underneath the light. 
Um, so those habitually cling on to the Western binary thinking and the Western binary dichotomous paradigms will have difficulties grasping how Chinese people navigate in the seemingly seamless web of political control. Now I want to emphasize that all Chinese people, not just Chinese activists, have a, have a subtle mindset. They are very good at finding uh, creative ways of walking around obstacles. That's, uh, this said, uh, NGOs in liberal societies tend to practice non-confrontational activism by default, and it is imperative they make change within the system. I'm going to give you a quote uh, to further unbundle this paradox. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this quote was from Anthony Sage. He was the former chief of Ford Foundation in Beijing. He now teaches at Harvard's um, uh, Kennedy School. So he said, Chinese NGOs voluntary subordination to the existing state structure should be viewed not as a measure of expediency, but a strategic move to enhance their ability to manipulate the official and semi-official institutions for their own advantage, which means making more impact on society and gaining a louder voice in policy making discussions than if they were to remain completely autonomous. And I may add, uh, risk being uh, crushed immediately by the authorities if they create uh, the NGO outside of the state structure. Um, so uh, herein lies the fundamental difference between Western NGOs and their Chinese counterpart. I want to take this opportunity to point out another level, uh, another set of difference between Western civil society and Chinese civil society. Western civil society came into existence as a result of the agitating growth of the social the Chinese civil society could only be born and flourished as a result of the voluntary retreat of the state from society. And that retreat of the state from society, of course, has been a gradual and measured uh, process. Um, there is no doubt that the gray zones in China were much bigger in size under the Hu Jintao regime than under the current regime. However, I would say they will always be a gray zone for Chinese activists. It will never disappear. When a politically sensitive issue areas occur uh, that may endanger an NGO, the NGO's will and its ability to negotiate with the local state out of, it, out of the dilemma is critical to uh, its survival. Uh, in the q and I, I would be glad to share with you uh, more uh, examples or more strategies of how to cope with uh, the censors. Uh, so bearing non-confrontational ethos in mind, uh, let's move on to the examples of social media activism staged on uh, Weibo. First, a quick definition of social media activism. It refers to social actions triggered through peer-to-peer -peer networking between weak ties and furthermore those social actions are mobilized via viral communications to create online support communities at scale. So I picked uh, five examples. Um, the first example is called a shaved head action. In the mid 2000s, Guangzhou based activist Peng Yanhui wrote a web blog calling for 1000 netizens, fellow netizens to shave their heads as a symbolic gesture to stop the city's night illumination project on the Pearl River, which would cost uh, the city taxpayers uh, more than 150 million yuan without much justification. Uh, Peng Yanhui posted his photos before and after the shave um, and, uh, on Weibo, and in 20 hours, he attracted 4,000 retweets and recruited more than 20 people to follow him and, sh and shave their heads, including a young woman and a few children. So what does uh, shaving one's head have anything to do with uh, energy conservation? Well, Peng Yanhui argued mockingly that a thousand shaved heads could generate enough brightness to light up uh, the Pearl River and render the, the lavish city project unnecessary. 
So we know that uh, every joke is a tiny revolution because it upsets the established order. And Peng Yanghui's uh, cheeky Weibo post went viral precisely because protests triggered by humor. Humor is, an, uh, is a potent form of non-confrontationalism. So protests triggered by humor camouflage uh, the agitators and dumb funding uh, the censors. Uh, under the pressure of public outcry and media exposure, the city government eventually trimmed down the original, the original budget of night illumination by four-fifths, which is quite a victory for Peng Yanhui. My second example uh, deals with uh, Thumbs Up Sister. Now, when Peng Yanhui was, uh, made his protest against the city, city's night il uh, illumination project, this young woman who dubbed herself Thumbs Up Sister uh, did a simultaneous protest against the city government for its lack of transparency about the decision-making process that led to the creation of such a wasteful project. So in the name of safeguarding public interest and um, uh, in pursuit of governmental accountability, she demanded <clears throat> that the city government make available a crucial document that underwrote the night illumination project. Her petition for a copy of that document uh, hit the stone wall. Uh, it was like they were passing the buck from one office to the next and never gave her a response. So she was feeling very frustrated. She then turned to Weibo to recruit 1,000 netizens willing to post their thumbs up photos. Now, thumbs up really is a satirical play signifying just the opposite, thumbs down. Uh, while waiting for the, 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 the responding post to trickle in, uh, this feisty young woman uh, raised the stakes by bringing two special presents, gifts, to the city, to the city hall to further embarrass the authorities. What did she bring? She brought a jumbo white pear. Now in Chinese, this kind of pear is pronounced as ya li, which is homophonous to another Chinese word, pressure, ya li. Uh, the other, so she was actually bringing the uh, more pressure to the city hall. The other present she brought to, to the city officials uh, it was, was a plastic ball shaped like a porcupine alluding to the government's antics of passing citizen petitions like hot potatoes from court to court. So hundreds of thumbs up photos turned up uh, under the hashtag thumbs up sister, uh, delivering the facetious message to targeted officials. The tactic that she resorted to was Ming Bao Anbian, theming by fake praising, which is a form of indirect censure uh, familiar to the Chinese, schooled in the politics of sarcasm for thousands of years. Uh, the playful Weibo fans understood her strategy instantaneously. So a small sensation was created online and not surprisingly, this feisty young woman got, uh, finally got a face-to-face -face interview with the city officials. My next example is a LGBTQ example. When uh, Iceland's Prime Minister Johanna and, his, uh, and her lesbian lover were paying a state visit to China, this NGO, Supporter for Gay Love, uh, uh, strategized ways of using social media to uh, promote a social acceptance of homosexuality. Now, during and after the state visit, um, her wife was nowhere to be seen in mainstream media because she was removed predictably from all media reports. So the NGO founder spread the news through a blog post, uh, which uh, Sena.com, the host publisher, featured on its uh, homepage for several days. And you can imagine this blog was an instantaneous uh, attention grabber. Uh, with a click rate of more than 600, uh, I'm sorry, 800,000 times uh, within a few days, it kicked off a tongue-in-cheek campaign slogan, let's search for the prime minister's harmonized wife.
Okay, so my next example is Free Lunch for Children, which is a very famous Weibo campaign uh, launched by uh, Deng Fei. Uh, he's a free agent, a journalist. He discovered that Guizhou province lacked canteens. So he launched a crowdfunding campaign on Weibo, uh, Free Lunch for Children. He successfully mobilized the millions, um, uh, hundreds of millions of Chinese netizens to participate in the campaign by donating one yuan. Uh, he then used the funds raised to feed more than 80,000 children per day in more than 300 schools spread over central and western parts of China. Now, most significantly, the network effect of that campaign forced the Chinese government to respond in kind. In 2012, China's State Council rolled out a policy which allocated 16 billion yuan per year to improve the nutrition of rural students. By early 2015, 32 million children in 1,300 counties have benefited from the governmental uh, subsidy program. Uh, this case shows how microcharity can actually lead to successful advocacy. Why well, I call this uh, shadow advocacy because neither Deng Fei nor his uh, Weibo supporters were consciously engaged in policy advocacy. Um, I, well, other people may also say this is a case of Renghai uh, Zhanshu, human sea military tactics. Uh, the messaging goes like this, uh, Chinese style, okay? Uh, beware, the crowd has spoken. Can the government please pay attention? Okay, so uh, my final example is an environmental <clears throat> uh, activism example. The arrival of social media uh, platforms had made uh, environmental advocacy easier and more efficient um, and faster. Now, since 2009, there has been a proliferating number of uh, air monitoring, soil monitoring, metal water testing campaigns, uh, galvanizing citizen participation. Uh, the example I wanted to share is Green Beagle. The NGO uh, launched a PM 2.0 air monitoring campaign, uh, and they loaned uh, portable uh, air monitors to local residents uh, who, then report, uh, who then reported their uh, testing results on Weibo. Uh, Green Beagle also integrated a crowdfunding campaign initiative into their multi-city advocacy campaign. Simply put, their goal was to mobilize 1,000 donors per city, requesting a minimum of 25 yuan per person to purchase air monitoring equipment for each city. Now, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Guangzhou have all reached the goal. Uh, true to the spirit of Web 2.0, the original Beijing-based uh, movement was decentralized and, um, and, and the spread uh, over into multiple local campaigns, with uh, netizens all over China responding to the call by setting up their own city-named Weibo hashtag. For example, Wuhan PM 2.0 uh, to a 2.5 air monitoring or Shanghai PM 2.5 air monitoring and so on. So all those uh, campaigns uh, were created uh, with the purpose of bringing incremental change. Uh, by now it should be obvious that there are many activists in China and they are making social change in measured, uh, non-contentious and measured steps. Uh, scholars in China and the other parts of the world have been debating over the vice and virtue of slacktivism or fingertip philanthropy. Uh, those terms are derogatory descriptions of casual random um, acts, such as taking a snapshot of polluted river or sending a virtual leaf uh, to create a, a virtual tree, uh, as opposed to engaging in sustained environmental activism and longer term systemic operations uh, actions on the ground. Uh, as an activist myself and a practitioner of both online and offline uh, activism, I support the argument uh, that Twitter and other social media platforms um, have enabled activists to create new communities and spread their social causes to a wider public. 
I also believe that uh, small acts can add up uh, and can trigger qualitative change over time. So why do activists have to choose between online and offline act, uh, action? And why do we as researchers have to arbitrate which, which form is superior to the other? Well, we have another saying that runs parallel to all roads lead to Rome. Uh, the saying goes, uh, all rivers uh, find their ways to the ocean. So the ocean of compassion um, does not discriminate against small streams or drops of dew. Okay, now we come to the final uh, uh, topic on my menu, Future Village, which is a, a design for good um, a project that uh, I launched uh, last summer uh, in China. Uh, we all knew about uh, uh, smart city paradigms, right? Which is a top-down uh, investment-driven and governmental sponsored project that gives um, a digital facelift to big cities. NGO 2.0 is uh, interested in helping out villages, not uh, cities. Uh, we are committed to energizing grassroots network and reviving grassroots culture, and we are naturally drawn to methods built on grassroots mobilization. In a nutshell, the future village is driven by three horses, design for good, tech for good, and poverty alleviation. The future, program, uh, the future village program was inspired by the MIT Fab Lab model. Uh, as some of you may know, the Fab Lab model emphasizes the making of uh, uh, open source hardware and collaborative design with the clientele. And in this case, our clientele are the villages. Uh, the Fab Lab model demonstrates how an underserved community can be powered by technology and other means uh, at the grassroots level. So how do we go about this uh, program? Uh, after we identify a future village candidate, we first uh, asked the villagers to identify and to articulate a collective need. Uh, we then mobilized researchers and practitioners from different sectors to run a civic, uh, to run a civic hackathon as the first step. And I, and I emphasize this is the first step of building trust and the working relationship with the villagers. Uh, here is a, a working definition of uh, this first uh, step of the Future Village. Through hackathons, uh, we bring together makers and techies, software developers, researchers from material science, architecture, bioecology, design thinking, public art, art uh, practitioners, and more. And the participants include the villagers, university teachers and students, high school students, programmers, designers, uh, engineers, artists, etc. And jointly, we design a vision for Future Village. Uh, we have implemented this program in four villages. So here I want to share with you one village. Uh, this is a village in the Keqing Desert uh, in North China. Uh, An environmental NGO there contacted us. Now in China, <clears throat> the most conventional way of greening the desert is to drop the seed bombs into the desert and then leave the siblings there to survive by themselves, which as you can imagine, is not a very effective method of greening the desert. So this NGO, uh, instead of planting trees in the desert, they hemmed in a sandy area and built a fence around it uh, to ward off uh, intruding animals, intruding humans to let the land uh, recover by itself. Uh, their experiment uh, was very successful, as you can tell by looking at the satellite image. Did you see the square uh, square that has turned green? That was their uh, first experiment. Uh, but very few people knew about what they were doing. So they came to us, they came to NGO 2.0 with a communication need. They wanted more people to know about their unique method of greening the desert. So we ran a hackathon for them. Uh, we, uh, the hackathon produced uh, four solutions and I'm going to uh, share three solutions with you. The first solution, uh, the first uh, one team uh, resorted to the concept of earth art by working with artists to design earth shapes that look cool. 
we know that interest in earth art is communication intensive by itself. So it would create a very cool satellite image better than that uh, square uh, we saw. Uh, that's powerful communication. The second solution is a sound project. Uh, we're working with uh, music artists to design ways of collecting sound in the, in the, in the windy desert. Each season uh, would create, yield different uh, sounds. We then treat the sound and sell the sound bites as ringtones to help the NGO raise funds and to also uh, raise public awareness of the village. Um, our third uh, solution is a WeChat game. Uh, the game starts with a, uh, a green, uh, a, a piece of green land and the player has to eject uh, uh, animals and humans that were dropped from above onto the green land. And if the ejection is successful, then the green expands. If it fails, then the green shrinks. All right, so those are the solutions uh, that came out of the hackathon. So what about the next steps? Well, after the hackathon is done, uh, we then enter the village with uh, experts, high school students, university students, uh, uh, at the regular intervals. Uh, we engage in on-site conversation with uh, villagers and the village leadership to explore other needs that could be tackled by our team. And the goal of those uh, regular visits is to explore the possibilities uh, of uh, helping villagers to discover new forces of production, improve their environment and livelihood, and also enrich the cultural life of village children. Mo most of them were left behind children because their parents usually go to big cities to, <clears throat> to work, uh, to make their ends, uh, to make a living. Uh, so the cultural life of village children, we like to enrich uh, the cultural life of village children through a variety of measures, uh, some of which would involve uh, media and, uh, tech, uh, and technology. But not everything we do is technological uh, because we also involve uh, other, other people, uh, public art practitioners uh, in the program, uh, for example. Uh, <clears throat> this is a quick bird's eye view of our collaborators uh, on, on the Future Village program. You can tell by, there are three universities, um, two IT companies, a museum, and uh, Tacky communities. I'm sharing the Future Village program with you for a purpose. I wanted to illustrate how NGO 2.0 operates. Uh, building multi sectoral collaboration is our DNA. Uh, we work with uh, different sectors to produce social good. And the sectors include not only the NGO sector, but also uh, the universities, IT companies, design companies, tacky communities, and so on. Uh, I should call all those social actors non-confrontational change makers. And together we are building a decentralized multi-sectoral coalition that is purposeful but non-contentious, driven by a powerful and spoken consensus of all the parties involved to build a better society. Uh, this is the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, and I welcome comments and uh, questions. Thank you. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm, I have a question that I wanted to yeah. start off with. Okay. Um, and, and that is, um, you know, in some of the examples that you, um, that you described, and I'm thinking specifically of the young woman who, um, you know, brought the, was yeah. it the white pair, um, in some ways, you know, you could say that that is, is confrontational, but it's, it's okay. not, right? Um, okay. And, yeah. and um, but there, you know, that young woman, you know, must have felt um, like the, the, mm -hmm. the, that the risks were not as high as, um, you know, that, that there was enough that she would have a, enough of a response, a popular response, so that whatever risks 
involved might have been okay. yeah, um, sure. uh, minimized, uh, right? Yeah. Um, and I, so I guess my I have a couple of questions that branch off from that example, and that is, um, one, you know, what, in, in terms of your own understanding or definition of what counts as confrontational, what mm -hmm. does not, mm -hmm. what is non-confrontational, yeah. Okay. You know, is that based upon um, just the Western ideas of that you're pushing back against of, of uh, sort of direct on the, you know, boots on the ground action? And yeah. then just quickly, the second part of that is, um, you know, have you seen examples where, um, where the, where individuals or NGOs have engaged in what might have felt like or seemed like non-confrontational -conf activism um, in the way that you're describing it, but the state saw that as crossing a certain line mm -hmm. right, and okay. pushed back. Yeah, sure. This is a, a very good question because it allows me to talk about several things that I didn't have uh, time to address in my talk. First of all, uh, the, the uh, thumbs up sister and uh, the guy who shaved his head, they live in Guangzhou. Now, locale is very important. Uh, China is not a homogenous entity. Uh, Guangzhou is known to be one of the most um, uh, liberal, uh, one, of, one of the most open-minded and, and the liberal uh, city uh, in China. And also, okay, uh, uh, so here I can I can share with you our experience in the uh, in 2010 and 2011. We did uh, uh, we did two um, uh, literacy so social media literacy training workshops, one in Yunnan and one in Anhui, and we we had a very bad time because we were pursued by um, public security officers in those uh, provinces. So. This is something fascinating about China because it, uh, the, uh, well, every locale has a different definition of what is, toler uh, what is tolerable, what is, what is the boundary, right? Um, every locale sort of uh, is uh, semi-autonomous in deciding on what is allowed to take place within my province. Uh, so after, 2010, after those two bad ex, uh, experiences, I made a decision in 2011 to hold a uh, workshop in Beijing, right under the nose of the emperor. And I, my logic went that if they didn't, if the center, if the central uh, government didn't like what I'm doing, then just shut me down. I, would, I don't want to play the, uh, the cat and, 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 and mice game with the local uh, with the local governments. So this is one thing, uh, Guangzhou is very liberal, that allowed them to do what they did. I don't think what they did would be tolerated in Yunnan, for example, or in Beijing. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that the guidelines for censorship is not what we thought uh, in the West. Uh, the Chinese censors uh, do not necessarily uh, disallow individual dissent. What they care about is to prevent individual dissent from escalating into a collective action against the government. So uh, to, a, to a certain extent, individual dissent is allowed. Uh, it is because of the discrepancies of locale uh, it allows activists uh, to navigate. So if I couldn't do something in Beijing, I, I can do it in, uh, uh, in Jiangsu province or other places. All right. Thanks. Yes, Anba? Hi, uh, thank you so much for your talk. I was wondering what themes or cases have you noticed that get more like positive responses uh, in activism and also how to cope with the, I guess like pro-government bots who might want to obstaculize um, the collective action uh, 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 online. Like, uh, yeah. 
I didn't get the second part of the oh, like how, how to cope with the government bots uh, online. Government we, bots, bots like yeah, like B O T S. Bots, uh, like the fake okay. profiles that might want to um, like prohibit, you know, like uh, these like actions online. Okay. All right. Uh, um. Um. First question, um, uh, what kind of uh, uh, NGO issue areas that are more acceptable, right, to the, to the government? Uh, well, many Chinese NGOs create uh, state-sanctioned nonprofit programs, for example, providing educational assistance to children living in poor, family, uh, in poor families in rural and urban China, or providing social welfare uh, to the elderly and the, uh, the other friend, uh, disfranchised groups and so on. Uh, I didn't quite understand the second question. So uh, could somebody maybe help uh, uh, rephrasing the question? Emily. <laughs> uh, I, another word I think you might be reaching for, Ambar, is um, moderators. Like how do moderators work on online Chinese forums um, to censor what people say? Oh, they, they have a list of uh, tabooed terms and uh, concepts. Uh, uh, internally, the, every social media platform uh, hired uh, 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 those officers uh, to uh, monitor the posts. So they have a list. Um, is that? Um, and uh, I- More or less, but how, how an activist could like, try to Go keep out. your own like campaign uh, without, you know, like getting like censor. Okay. Like, oh yeah, sure. Okay. There are, there are different strategies. Okay. There are different strategies. Uh, one strategy is to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to make incremental change, which is crucial. You know, a, a, a measured step-by-step -step change agenda alleviates the anxieties of the state. So that's uh, rules of the thumb, first one. Second, uh, it has to do how you position yourself. Uh, for example, NGO 2.0, I could have positioned NGO 2.0 as a media uh, focused NGO, but media is too sensitive. So instead I position ourselves as a technology driven uh, NGO. I very rarely use the word media. Uh, in China. Uh, the other uh, strategy would be uh, resorting to the, to the tactics of camouflage. Uh, strategic hiding uh, or systemic mimicry aimed at effacing one's own presence from the photographic media of surveillance. Uh, and there are many examples of, uh, of, uh, uh, of camouflage. The other uh, a, a very, a very popular uh, method of coping with censors is to resort to the rhetoric of the powerful to curb the exercise of power. What I meant is legitimize, uh, legitimizing and framing your contention by employing state laws, official policy, discourse, state propaganda, governmental commitments to hamstring concerned party elites for support and for collaboration. Um, uh, uh, in, in more concrete terms, so let me give you an example about organizations run by Tibetans and Muslims in China. They typically frame their mission uh, as cultural perseverance rather than the promotion of religious diversity. And take, and, uh, take uh, uh, HIV AIDS organizations, they typically frame a uh, resort to public health uh, approach rather than dwelling on the issues of human rights. So there are many, many ways to uh, walk around uh, the obstacles. But uh, uh, incrementalism is what everybody sort of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, resorts to. I'm very happy that I am in the US because that sort of, um, prevented us from making jumps and leaps uh, in our activities, which is good for us. 
Uh, the other thing, uh, the other thing is that one has to have a low profile. So for the first five years uh, uh, during the NGO 2.0, uh, while I was running NGO 2.0, I rejected all interviews uh, by media. Uh, because we were too weak at that time at the beginning and I didn't want to be identified. So it was not until uh, after 2014, after we were officially registered as an MPO that I began to uh, talk to journalists in China. I think both Eric and Diego had hands up. Um, but I didn't see who raised their hands first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I guess I guess I can go. Uh, thank oh, you thanks. for hi for your presentation. Uh, I really love the reference to James Scott work. Uh, I think it was really good. Uh -huh. uh, so, but I have a question probably related to uh, Professor Bolt's uh, question mm -hmm. about like Northwestern and Western this kind of like differentiation. Uh, I was thinking about the, uh, this opposition uh, because there is also sometimes where actions that, that seek social change in no Western context take, uh, take a confrontational stance, right? S especially like I'm thinking in the context of Latin America, probably not in China, right? Uh, th there are sometimes like colectivos or frentes that occupy certain terrains and suddenly build a, a village or build a, a shanty town because they are fighting for housing rights. Um, and this obviously breaks the rule of law, right? As, as we understand in, the, in like kind of like Western civic context, right? So I know your work is focused on China specifically, but I, I, I guess my, my, my question would be uh, how, how if we can think about like activism from a global perspective, uh, taking not into account so much binaries between no Western and Western perspective, but more like a gradient or a more nuanced view of what is like actually confrontational, probably not so confrontational uh, strategies from activism, yeah. Um, uh, do you mind uh, rephrasing your question? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I'm thinking if we can like uh, probably surpass uh, binary conceptions, bi binary conceptions of activism of, between Western and non-Western, and think more about probably a nuanced view of like probably something is more confrontational than other, and not so much assigned a non-confrontational or confrontational oh. yeah, stand. There, yeah, yeah. It, there is a, well, as I said earlier, there is a continuum of situations. So there are different gray, uh, there are different shades of gray, right? Uh, um, so I, 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 I actually don't know how to, uh, how to, um, how to respond to your question, um, except that um, uh, that um, uh, that, they, that 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 it is well, the gray zones is really really I think big, right? Uh, uh, even though it varies from regime to regime, but uh, but it is there and. Uh, um, one, you know, I think uh, one has to, uh, well, as an activist, you always try to walk the fine line between, uh, well, in authoritarian countries, you walk a fine line between compliance and self-empowerment, which is not an intuitive exercise. Um, so, yeah, well, uh, uh, well, in China now, it's uh, quite impossible to openly challenge uh, the Chinese government, and I think uh, Hong Kong, the Hong Kong protests uh, serves as a good example um, that, um, well, that um, uh, the Hong Kong situation, I think, uh, calls for a to, uh, a, an entirely different uh, re 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 response than what I uh, talked about uh, 
Yeah. Uh, what What do you think? I mean, what uh, since since I'm not sure I completely understood your question, and I would like to uh, get a sense of how you uh, approach uh, your own question. Uh, well, so, so I, I guess that there is like a there are there are not necessarily a correspondence between like non-confrontational and non-Western activism, but probably no, in non-Western context, you can have confrontational strategies. And so I, 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 I guess I, I, I'm, I'm trying to complicate the issue of like, not necessarily uh, approaching certain contexts with a certain framing of how activists should be in this context. Uh, uh, I, well, I you know, non-confrontationalism is just a, a term that incorporates all kinds of approaches, right? Um, okay. um, Eric, would you like to go next? And then it looks like uh, Tomas and then Emily. Great, thanks. Uh, and thanks for the really uh, interesting talk. I have a number of questions, but I'm gonna keep it to one. Okay. Um, I'm specifically interested in what you talked about, um, the kind of multi-sectoral collaboration um, that you talked about at the end. And, um, and my question comes from uh, work that I'm actually doing in Eastern Europe around the same, this, this same concept and trying to understand um, ways in which um, you know groups from multiple sectors can effectively collaborate towards common cause mm -hmm. um, in in uh, in in the Eastern European context, there is government involved. I imagine that in um, in the Chinese context, government is not one of the sectors mm -hmm. uh, that is that is involved. But what I'm interested in is, um, and I know the difficulty in this work is aligning the incentives of the different. Uh, the different players, and so I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about how, sure, how you've how you've addressed that, how you work to align those incentives to okay. to achieve your goals. All right, uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, MIT is a powerful brand name, which allowed me to really quickly uh, round up uh, collaborators. It took me like a couple of months to set up NGO 2.0 in 2008. And uh, I think Asian people, uh, including the Chinese, uh, really worship uh, a, a, a university like MI, uh, MIT. I, I remember once uh, riding in a taxi in Beijing and uh, got into a conversation with the taxi cab driver and he asked me, he, he knew that I was not local because uh, I just didn't look like a local Beijinger. So I told him that I'm a professor and he said, oh, yeah, he thought it was Chinese professor. But uh, then I said, MIT. He went like, oh my God, MIT, uh, can I have a photo with you? <laughs> so that kind of um, uh, um, uh, positive uh, uh, re response to MIT. So the brand name uh, helped a great deal. Uh, the, uh, the MIT brand name helped me uh, round up uh, techies. Uh, uh, and the universities. Uh, it is um, effortless for me to set up um, um, to set up collaborative uh, ties with uh, Chinese universities. I think uh, always the challenge is uh, it's easier to invite collaborators, but it's difficult to let them go. So now I'm getting very cautious about inviting people to join. Incentives. Uh, um, the, those people, okay, uh, the social sector in China is a rather small sector. Uh, everybody knew each other, sort of. So if you identified one uh, collaborator, uh, they, you will be led to the others. Uh, uh, we work with uh, IT corporations. Uh, we really don't work with the IT companies themselves. We work with uh, the volunteers within the IT company. They are techies, they are programmers, or they are hardware um, uh, <clears throat> makers. Um, so um, I guess, well, did I, did I, uh, um, did I uh, answer some of your questions or 
Now, do you want to sort of uh, yeah keep keep uh, keep asking if I didn't uh, uh, give you a a full answer? Uh, you, uh, well, I can follow up with you later. I know we're almost out of time, so I'll let other people okay. ask questions. Right. I know there's other okay. other questions. All right, thank you, uh, Tomas. How's it going? Um, so I'm interested in the in the role of funding. So I know that a very a common um, the liberal regimes used to constrain the role of NGOs is to not allow them to receive external funding or to yeah to find a way to um, indirectly restrain them in that sense. And I was wondering, um, yeah, in your work, how has this resulted in in bringing funding probably from the U.S. right? And how do Chinese NGOs work with that? Okay, so funding uh, kept me uh, kept me awake at night. Actually, since I started uh, NGO 2.0, my insomnia got worse. I have to pay for my employees, right? Uh, we were funded by Ford at uh, the beginning uh, for 10 years. Actually, they continue to fund us. Uh, uh, and because of their funding, we were sort of uh, suspect, right, in the eyes of... Uh, the public security officers, and also in the eyes of other collaborators. Uh, before we got registered in 2014, it was difficult for us to really attract funding in China. Uh, but I do not want to get more funding from the US because it would make us look even more dangerous, right? Uh, so, um, I was able to, uh, again, use my MIT, uh, uh, the logo, MIT uh, logo, to uh, attract funding from, um, uh, from companies like uh, a financial company, actually. They funded uh, us to uh, develop our uh, cross-source philanthropy map. Um, we, my goal is to diversify our funding so that uh, we would not be uh, it, uh, left in the cold if one funder walked away. Uh, fourth one, we had a very difficult year in 2008 because the Chinese government clamped down on foreign NGOs, meaning Ford Foundation was monitored. And they, uh, for the whole year, I, we, we did not have any funding. Uh, and it was a very difficult year. Uh, but now things got better. Uh, Ford Foundation, uh, I think, uh, passed the passed another hurdle, and they are fine. They they are uh, under the jurisdiction of the U.S. China Friendship uh, Association, and they continue to fund us. But they are not the only funder, so we are in a better situation. Uh, did I answer your question, Thomas? Yeah, perfectly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Uh, Emily, and then um, we have a, a question from the attendee Q&A after Emily. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much for speaking to us today. Uh, I have a question about um, the people who are leading these movements to create incremental, in, sorry, incremental <laughs> change, uh, like the woman whose um, photo you showed who brought that pair to the like city oh, right. building, um, and then the young man who shaved his head. Um, I'm wondering, whether um, there's a certain threshold beyond which if they lead too many movements, they become kind of a person of interest and um, can't really continue to try to create change in different ways. Um, and then also how that varies by, by region. Um, I imagine it might, uh, based on what you were talking about earlier. And then also by their um, kind of, um, like level of awareness or level of um, well, like high, prof high profileness. Like if you are, um, you know, at, for example, your level versus someone who's just a young person in a, in a city, um, whether your relative sort of um, command of power might affect your ability to continue to create incremental, incremental change across different movements. And sorry, that was really convoluted. So let me know if I should. No, no, that's okay. I, I will. I will adjust your question if I, I if I didn't give you a satisfactory answer. You can always uh, follow up uh, with another question. So yeah, uh, I would imagine that uh, uh, that uh, the uh, thumbs up sister would not do another Weibo campaign, right? Because then she would be inviting uh, the spotlight, which is not good. 
that explains why I have stayed uh, low. Uh, I had I have kept a low profile until 2015, because I do not want to. Incrementalism is about anonymity. So why are you going to why why do you want to uh, attract the media attention to you? In Chinese, we have another saying. Um, uh, a pig is afraid of being fat because that will be the time for the for the pig to be slaughtered. So, um, so 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 that uh, yeah, um, you you're supposed to keep a low profile, um, and I don't think uh, she will uh, keep uh, uh, protesting uh, or uh, at uh, on another occasion. It would be very dangerous. But Peng Yanghui he. He, uh, he has been working with uh, an NGO in Guangzhou uh, all the time, so he's fine. Uh, what are the other, I think you probably brought up another question, but I, I think I, I lost my focus. Uh, uh, I that was very helpful. Yeah, now did you have another question that uh, I haven't uh, addressed? I think you, you covered it, thank okay. you. All right, great, thank you. Well, I have a, um, a question from Hamid Reza uh, in the Q&A um, who asks or, uh, about culture specifically. Um, and uh, here's the question. Um, I was wondering about non-confrontational activism in the art scene, especially in underground spaces, music, cinema, literature, etc. Uh, two things. One, their modes of production and distribution. And second, how does your argument regarding the paradox of invisibility under the light hold for that scene? For do, you mind, uh, do you mind pasting that question onto the chat sure. box? Sure. I can look at it. Second. Oh, Q and A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I saw. It. I think I saw that. Well, you may be able to see it actually. Oh, here. There we go. Okay, all right. And then in the art scene, especially in the ground spaces, non-confrontational activism in the art scene. <clears throat> uh, what does your argument regarding products? Um, in the art scene, uh, would you say that the, uh, the earth art uh, example, I think that, that is an example of, uh, <clears throat> of, uh, of non-confrontational activism? And how does the argument regarding? Well, you see, the thing about non-confrontationalism is that you shouldn't be afraid of being uh, exposed because it is non-confrontational. Uh, does that make sense? Is well, let me. Why don't I yeah. follow up on that a little bit? <laughs> and the, is there a um, yeah? Is there a vibrant kind of underground music scene, for example, where um, both in terms of lyrically and in terms of the kind of spaces that that young people are uh, building, um, you know, do those also become spaces that uh, are okay. all under this all rubric right. of non-confrontational activism? Well, listen. <laughs> The album, uh, the company, uh, the music company would not would not release uh, a song or an album that is considered uh, problematic. So, and also, you know, I, I think uh, in China, it's not just the censorship uh, uh, imposed on uh, practitioners, but internal censorship. Uh, you internalize the. Uh, in, you internalize uh, as a citizen, you internalize uh, things that you think might create a stir or invite uh, the, uh, the unnecessary uh, attention from the public, uh, from the state or from the public. So uh, I, would, I would say uh, China relies more on uh, this kind of internal censorship inner policing, inner policing, then external censorship. Um, but to answer your question quickly, 
no art, new music that is made public uh, will, be, will be problematic because they're already filtered. There's already a filtering system that screened out uh, the, 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 the so-called dangerous or politically incorrect uh, messaging. Uh, but uh, there's one thing that, that I think you all need to know is that uh, the sensors are not like, they're not like devils. Uh, they, they communicate with you. you know, if they spot something problematic, like with us, we were approached by, by sensors. Sometimes, you know, they didn't understand why we were doing this. So they came to us. They said, could we have a conversation? You know, I have a question about this. So you explain it to them. Uh, another example I had was years ago, I had an article published. I wanted to seek a publisher in, uh, in China. And eventually I got that piece published in Beijing, not in Shanghai. Contrary to your intuitive perception, Beijing is a, uh, is a place that has more free room to, for us to navigate than Shanghai. Because there are two governments in Beijing. There is the central government, there is the municipal government. So you, if, you, uh, if you lost the favor with one, with the father, you could go to your grandfather and you get your things done. Uh, so I, that article had a few words that uh, sort of hit the button, uh, hit, the, hit the flag. Uh, so I got an email one day from the publisher saying, hey, Professor Wang, this article is great. We'd love to publish it, but there are a few words. I would wonder if you would consider revising, would, you would consider replacing. So to my big surprise, one word that they singled out was uh, capitalism. <laughs> I was like, what on earth, you know, capitalism. So I replaced that word with the commodity economy. So they communicated with, with you. If an NGO is in trouble, you will get a call from the local government. And the, the, uh, euphemism, uh, the euphemism is you will be invited out to have tea. You're invited out to have tea, meaning the censor wants to talk to you. So you sit down and you uh, sort things out and you make some adjustment. Uh, communication dialogues is crucial for NGOs to operate smoothly. Something that the Hong Kong protesters didn't do or didn't want to do, which was uh, really sad. Um, Okay. okay, I think we're just coming up on 630. Um, so I uh, just wanted to thank you sincerely um, for, for this really rich talk and, and discussion. Um, and thank all of you um, who attended.